Is the season to be looking, looking for snow, if it's warm, for mistletoe, if he's dense, <laughs> for instructions, if some assembly is required. Tis the season to be looking for red lights. If you're a child, Santa is coming. Headlights. If you're grandma, the kids are coming. Insights. If you're a preacher, Christmas Eve is coming. Tis the season to be looking. The first Christmas was marked by lookers as well. Joseph looked for lodging. Mary looked into the wrinkled face of the just born baby a thousand angels looked upon the king the wise men looked at the star but no one was looking with the intensity of a seasoned saint by the name of Simeon here's his story now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised. You may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Unlike Joseph and Mary, Simeon did not witness the birth of Jesus. Unlike the wise men, he did not travel to Bethlehem. By the time he saw Jesus, the swaddling clothes had been packed away and the manger contained only hay. Mary and Joseph had caught up on their sleep and the shepherds were back to their sheep. Forty days had passed. We can say this with certainty because of the Jewish law. According to the Torah, the mother became ceremonially unclean upon the birth of a child. On the eighth day, the baby was circumcised. After an additional 33 days, 66 if the child was a female, the parents would come to the temple and offer a sacrifice. It was a baby dedication of sorts. And it was at this dedication that Simeon saw Jesus. Simeon was likely an old man gray-haired, silver beard, stooped shoulders. The years had etched his skin and slowed his step, but nothing had stilled his heart. We begin, if you'd like to fill in the blanks, with Simeon's longing. Simeon's longing. He was waiting for the day when God would take away Israel's sorrow. A day in which God would end the alienation between himself and and reconcile themselves to him. 
He knew, Simeon did, that this day would come in his day. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen him, God's anointed king. Now, how did the Spirit tell Simeon? In a dream, in a vision, in a sermon, through a scripture, we do not know. But we do know that Simeon lived with an eye toward the future. Some years ago, I preached a series of messages at our church called Perhaps Today. And we took those two words and put them, printed them nicely on a sheet of paper and gave them to everyone in the congregation. Well, some time ago, I was in one of our members' homes and I saw those words decades later framed, hanging on a wall, they wanted that reminder, every day is a perhaps today day. Simeon lived with this possibility, perhaps today. He lived with an expectation. He knew he would see the Messiah on earth before he saw his father in heaven. Consequently, on the 40th day after Jesus' birth, the day arrived. And the scripture says Simeon was led by the Spirit to the temple. That's interesting, isn't it? He was led by the Spirit to the temple. Maybe he had other plans. Maybe he intended to water his garden that day or take the dogs on a walk or go play golf. He had something else in mind, perhaps. And then the Spirit led him to the temple. He sensed a longing, a nudging, a knowing and he turned to his wife and said, Honey, I think I'm going to go to the temple today. And he made his way through those narrow, ancient, cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. And when the butcher called his name, he waved, but he didn't stop. And when the cobbler called out Simeon's name, Simeon acknowledged him, but he didn't pause. He wanted to get to the temple. No matter how many times he ascended those temple steps, don't you know they stole the breath out of his lungs when he saw those large stones of double tonnage and those beautiful arcades, that miracle of Herod's construction, the temple. And so he went to the temple. He ascended those steps and he stepped into the temple courts. The place was crowded. It always was. Even on non-holidays, the place was crowded. Other young couples, like Joseph and Mary, would bring their baby to be dedicated. No one noticed Joseph and Mary. And there was nothing about them that would cause them to stand out from the other couples. And there was nothing about the baby in Mary's arms. The angels didn't go ahead of Mary and Joseph and scatter rose petals on the ground. And Jesus wasn't carried on a pillow. He didn't arrive in a chariot. There was nothing unique. There was no aura. There was no halo on his head. He was cute, sure. But he was common. He gurgled. He snorted. He, he slept. No one would have noticed Jesus, which is ironic, don't you think? Here, on the holiest acreage of ancient Israel, indeed the holiest acreage in history, people had come to see God. It never occurred to them that God was asleep in Mary's arms. But it occurred to Simeon Somehow Simeon knew of all the people, those were the people. And when he saw Joseph and Mary, <clears throat> he threaded his way through the crowd saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, until he got right up next to Joseph and he tapped Joseph on the shoulder. And Joseph and Mary turned. Mary is no longer round of belly, but she's probably round in her face, a peasant girl. Just a simple girl from out in the country. And Joseph is a carpenter. He probably wears the scratchy robe of a blue-collar worker. 
And there might have been a day when Joseph would have resisted this stranger tapping him on the shoulder. But so many weird things have happened over the last year. He's learned to expect the unexpected. That angel came and talked to him at night. Uh, those shepherds showed up with worship. The wise men came with gifts. And most of all, his wife, <clears throat> well, she knew what it was like to be a mother before she knew what it was like to be in his bed. So he's learned some unusual things are happening. And so when Simeon <clears throat> turned, and I mean, when Simeon tapped him on the shoulder, he turned. And when Simeon gestured as if to take the baby, Joseph turned to Mary and nodded. And Mary gave the baby Jesus <clears throat> to Simeon. And here's what Simeon did. This is Simeon's joy. <clears throat> Simeon took the baby in his arms. And he thanked God. Now, Lord, you can let me, your servant, die in peace, as you said. With my own eyes, I have seen your salvation, which you prepared for all people. The early church took this proclamation and turned it into a prayer. In Latin, it's called the nunc dimittis. Now dismiss. Now dismiss dismiss. Simeon saw this as a now moment. Now something has happened. Now history is different. Now the door has been swung open and it hung on that small hinge, that gate in Bethlehem, that when Mary gave birth to a child, a new era had begun, a new era that marked a new era for the life of Simeon, but also for all of history. And so Simeon says, now dismiss. Everything that Israel has been longing for has happened in the birth of this child. Everything that Simeon had been longing for had happened. Now, Simeon did not have a phrase with which to denote this chapter in history, but we do because we've read the rest of the Bible. And every writer in the New Testament refers to this last era of history. They call it the last days. And without exception, every person who picked up a pen to write parts of the New Testament spoke of the last days. Paul the apostle said, in the last days, there will be many troubles. Peter urged us to understand what will happen in the last days. The author of Hebrews understood the era of history. But now, in these last days, God has spoken to us through a son. John could not have been clearer. He said, my dear children, these are the what? These are the last days. The birth of Jesus triggered a new and final dispensation in history. The Bible is clear. A clock is ticking. A divine calendar is turning. And more sand rests at the bottom of the hourglass than at the top. Dismiss any notion that history is simply an endless succession of circles always coming back to where it begins. No, the Bible teaches us that history is a straight line, that there is a timeline, and there is a beginning, and there are important chapters, and there is a culmination. There is a conclusion. And because of Bethlehem, we know where we stand on this timeline. This is our conviction. Our conviction is simply this. These are the last days. This is it. The next great event is the second coming of Christ. We're not waiting on another patriarch like Abraham. We're not waiting on another prophet like Elijah. And we're certainly not awaiting a different Savior than Jesus Christ. 
We believe that the last days are these days and we're awaiting the return of Christ. Jesus himself said, I will come again. The author of Hebrews said, Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting on him. As he came, Christ will come, but he won't come as he came. As he came, Christ will come, but he won't come as he came. He came quietly in Bethlehem. He will return in glory with a shout. All who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. In Bethlehem, the baby Jesus slept. Upon his return, the Lord will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of an archangel with the trumpet call of God. At the first coming, few noticed. At his second, all the nations of the world will be gathered before him. In Bethlehem, Joseph placed Jesus in a manger. At his return, Jesus will be seated where? On a throne. The Son of Man will come in great glory with all his angels, and he will be king and sit on his great throne. Like Simon, we realize our place in history. We know where we are on the journey. If we're going to grandma's, our dad just said, straighten up, boys, we're almost home. We know where we are on the journey. And this affects the way we live. We realize that we could be in the generation that sees the return of Jesus Christ. And we long for it. There is a God-given longing. Something in our heart says there's more to life than this life and more to earth even than this earth, that there's something more than we have ever begun to imagine or dream that awaits us. And we heed that longing, that it is a hope, a blessed hope that gives us strength. And sometimes, truth be told, sometimes you wonder if you've been forgotten. Is he really coming for you? I'm so glad to say his arrival is closer than it's ever been. And it could very well be that before you and I die, we will see the return of Jesus Christ to establish an earthly kingdom and restore this planet to its intended splendor and his people to their purposed glory. Now, I do not know when Christ will return. I've heard some people say they do. They seem to know more about his return than he does sometimes. <laughs> but I don't. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. I really don't think anyone does. But I do believe there are six things, six stipulations, six requirements, six mile markers that will happen in, according to Scripture before Jesus comes back. I, I recorded these on your outline in case you want to study them at some point. First of all, there will be a preaching of the gospel to all nations. Second, there will be a great tribulation in which all saints, in, in which saints will suffer and the creation will tremble. There will be the coming of an antichrist. He's an enemy of God who will deceive many. There will be the salvation of many Jews. There will be signs in heavens and there will be false prophets. Now I would suggest to you that to a certain degree, each of these signs has seen fulfillment. The gospel has gone 
around the world. Certainly, it needs to be carried and penetrate. We need to penetrate other cultures much further than we have. But the gospel, by virtue of media and television and the internet, has gone all over the world. Many Christians have experienced severe tribulation. Some, some contend that the last hundred years have seen more martyrs for Christ in all, than in all of history. The world has suffered, certainly, at the hands of global villains that could be described as the Antichrist. Maybe another one's coming, or maybe he has already come. Many Jews are being saved. Many have been saved. And pockets of the Jewish culture are seeing unprecedented revival. Our skies have given up signs that baffle even the astronomers. Our earth has shaken from birth pangs, and certainly the church has been weakened by false prophets. It may very well be that these signs will see further fulfillment. No one is sure. But I think this much is certain. Christ could return at any moment. He could return at any moment. This could be the generation. This could be the Bethlehem generation of the new era. We could be the generation that witnesses the return of Christ. The clock is ticking down to its last minute. And if history is but a year, the autumn leaves are beginning to fall. I don't know if you've ever noticed in a football game. When the third quarter turns into the fourth, you'll see some of the players on the, on the sidelines stick up four fingers. Have you ever seen that? What do they yell? Fourth quarter, fourth quarter. Why? Well, the coach knows that as the game wears on, the players get tired. And they need a reminder. This is the most important quarter. Simeon did this. He's reminding us even today. Even though we get tired, even though we get weary, even though many of the world does not believe that there's going to be a return of Christ, we're going to hold fast to our confession of faith. And we're not going to go away weary, but we're going to keep looking. We're going to keep searching, perhaps today. And we're going to live like Simeon. We're going to lead our lives on tiptoe. I close with this question. If you knew Jesus was returning tomorrow, how would you feel today? If you knew without question that Jesus was returning tomorrow, how would you feel today? If your answer includes words like afraid, unsure, uncertain, concerned, then with all that is within me, I urge you, take care of that now. Confess your need for a Savior. Trust in Jesus and his death on the cross as adequate payment for all of your sins. And he will wash away all of your sins. And when he returns, he will look upon you as a righteous one. Because you have trusted him as your Messiah, your Savior. All of that fear can be gone. So if you knew Jesus were returning tomorrow, how would you feel? For many of you, the, the answer is excitement and joy, relief, happiness. You don't have to do your homework. <laughs> And for those of you who find joy at the thought, I urge you just to hang on to that joy. Heaven is God's ultimate answer to human hurt. Heaven is God's ultimate answer to human hurt. Until Christ comes, this world will always hurt. As much as we pray, as much as we struggle, as much as we try to help, there will always be hurt. So heaven is God's way of giving us hope beyond the hurt. So you hang on to that hope, will you? One last question. If Jesus were coming tomorrow, what would you do today? What would you do? How would you spend this day? If you knew Jesus were coming tomorrow, what would you do? Then do it. Do it. 
Go ahead. Make sure your family knows you love them. Write that letter of apology. Spend some extra time in prayer. Tell your neighbors about your hope. What would you do today? May you live in such a way that if you knew Christ was returning tomorrow, you would not have to change your itinerary for today. In the 18th century, many sailors who lived on the Atlantic coast would equip their houses with a widow's nest, a square fenced-in platform on the roof upon which the wife of a sailor could ascend and look for her husband. And she would, several times throughout the day, in between chores, climb up that spiral staircase until she came up on top of the roof, and she would search the horizon for the return of her husband. May you do the same. May the bride of Christ be always looking for Jesus. And who knows? (laughs) Maybe one of these days as we're searching the horizon... We will see that eastern sky open and hear that trumpet blast. And wouldn't that be something? Amen? Amen. Amen. So, Lord, please hear our prayer now as we receive your presence and your spirit to take these words and put them deep down in our hearts so that they bear fruit at the right time in the right way. Use our understanding of where we are in history to teach us to live lives on full alert where we do not despair, but we're always looking to you. And we thank you for this promise. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church said,